Fans, before we begin, just a quick reminder to join our friend Billy Kegler on the Competitive Mindset Podcast, where guests share how they differentiate themselves and achieve high levels of performance through the lens of motivation, competitiveness, and mindset. Join along on the journey to lifelong learning and improved performance with the Competitive Mindset Podcast. Follow along on social media at Competitive Pod. And if you haven't done it already, please check out teachhoops.com slash 816 basketball for unbelievable coaching resources from Coach Steve Collins. He also has an extremely active Facebook community. So again, teachhoops.com slash 816 basketball. And it's not too late to help out our boy Takuma Letsum during his fight with ALS. If you go to our Twitter page at 816 basketball on Twitter, find out all the details and how you can donate to help Tack in his fight. Hello and welcome to the Greatest Games Podcast brought to you by 816 Basketball. I'm one of your hosts, Brian Rosefield, and I'm joined by my co-host, Chris de Blasio. Thank you, Brian. Pleasure to be here on the Greatest Games Podcast. A chance for us to catch up with basketball coaches from around the country and have them tell us about their greatest game. As always, it can be their time as a head coach, an assistant coach, a college coach, a high school coach, just whatever game they consider to be their greatest. And, you know... Teaneck, New Jersey has a very special place in my heart. That was the first time I had been in New New Jersey. I was promptly transported over to New York. No, I guess I landed in New York, picked up by the family of one Chris de Blasio, got to see uh, a quick tour of New York, and then promptly went back to Teaneck for just a good old family Italian dinner. And uh, a boy from South Carolina just had a, a real cultural experience in Teaneck, New Jersey. So, so once again, we're going back to Teaneck, this time virtually, to the associate head coach of Fairleigh Dickinson University. And one gentleman that has probably been recommended about 90 times for us to have on this podcast, the greatest introduction ever for Bruce Hamburger. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Coach. No, thank you. It's great to be with you guys. Well, yeah, Coach. I mean, the I mean, listen. You better live up to it. Is really what we're getting. Yeah, there's a lot of pressure. Just I mean, Chris, on. Chris Gaskin, John Ziemba, Bill Zotti, Pete Marion, all these guys. You gotta have Bruce Hamburger on. He's great. You gotta have. So you know, we finally reached out. Uh, we didn't want to reach out during the season. Obviously, this season was hard enough already. Uh, Try to figure out every day, but uh, we're glad to have you on now. No, thank you. I appreciate it. Those are, those are some great names right there. You just reeled off. Those are some. Uh, some good New Jersey basketball people. So no, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be with you guys. Except Coach Marion. Except <laughs> <even> Pete. <laughs> Coach, why don't you uh, take us through your journey a little bit? You've been, you've been around a long time. I'm not trying to show your age, but uh, just kind of take us through your basketball coaching journey quickly. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know what? I, I, I love to play as a kid. I mean, I think it started when I was a kid. I love to play. I, I probably played more than anyone I knew or who I grew up with. And just wasn't that good, but I still loved it. I mean, I, I literally got cut four years in a row in high school and, but still, I don't know. There's just, you guys know, there's something with this game that just draws you in. And I, I realized at a pretty young age that I loved the game. I wasn't good enough to play at, at any level. I mean, with that being said, I played a year in college, actually JV at, at a D2 school, but I, you know, I, I just knew that I wanted to be connected with basketball. So in my mind, I'm going to be, you know, a high school coach and a high school teacher, uh, got, got a degree in physical education. And when I was in high school, I actually started coaching one of the, there was like a seventh and eighth grade team in the town. And the guy that used to be the high school coach in my town, who was the, the, like one of those legendary high school coaches, teachers that everyone gravitated towards kind of took me under his wing a little bit and I was quote unquote his assistant and I just there was just you guys know you start coaching there's just something special about it and you know I was fortunate enough when I, when I was in college to then be an assistant coach at my high school team so I never was able to play there but I ended up coaching there and and we had a really good player this kid Mark Bryan who played at Seton Hall playing the NBA for, you know, 20 years was just watching today in the Nets game. He's an assistant with the Phoenix Suns and was fortunate enough to be able to coach Mark 
for three years in high school. And the guy who was the head coach did not want to deal with any of the college coaches. So I, I was probably 19, 20 years old and I'm literally his liaison to all the, he was probably a top 50 kid in the country at that time. And I was sitting in on a million different home visits, constant communication on the phone with all these college coaches. And I just, it, it just struck me like, wow, like you can be a college coach as a full time job, not have to teach. And it just, it just struck me like, this is something that I want to do and was fortunate enough right out of college to get a graduate assistantship for two years at Trenton state college. And from there, I went back to, I went to Seton hall. Um, you know, again, I got to know that coaching staff through Mark's recruitment, uh, was, was able to stay at Seton hall for nine years, became a head coach at Kane university, you know, a good D three program here in Jersey for 11 years. And then, you know, I've bounced around a little bit since then, but, you know, uh, again, I, I haven't worked a day in my life yet. I'm still waiting for that, uh, you know, first day that I got to go to work. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a great, great profession. You know, I, I, I really enjoy it still and, uh, had, had a great journey so far. So when you found out that you could coach full-time and that could be your full-time job without having to teach, um, what was that process like? And I'm not saying back then as it, Oh, 50 years ago when you, but right. this, I think it's, I, I, I'm curious as the differences now that guys are trying to cut their teeth and trying to get college jobs. So what, what are the differences between now and, and then when you were able to do that? Yeah. You know, it, it, it goes both ways. Now there's so much more opportunity because, you know, and not every D one school, but at least the high ones, there's so many more staff positions. You know, there's the director of ops, the assistant director of ops, the coordinator of the, you know, there's just a, th a million titles. I mean, college basketball's kind of approaching college football with the amount of people on staff. So in one sense, there are more opportunities now. Um, but I, th I think the, the business has changed clearly. You know, it, it, it used to be much more about can you coach and can you teach? Now it's more, you know, are you connect? It, there's a lot of, hey, are you connected to a player? Are you connected to an AU team? Um, so it, it, the, the business has changed. But, you know, I, I think, again, it, it's just like every business. It's, it's networking. It's contacts. It's who you know. Um, unfortunately, it's probably not as much what you know now as opposed to who you know. But still, at the end of the day, at some point in time, you know, you're standing there at a basket with a ball and six or eight players and you got to do a drill and you got to teach and you got to coach. So, you know, you still have to be able to um, to do that. And, and I think to be truthful uh, and, and that's what really I think things like this, you know, the past year, all the Zoom clinics and, you know, there's so much more opportunity now to learn the game um, where back then you. You know, there, there were one or two clinics a year that you were fortunate enough to maybe if they were in your neighborhood or in your area to go to. Now you just, you know, you, you go you go on the Internet and there's so much you can pull up, you know, Twitter and just, you know, there's so many people making a living out of basketball that you can learn from. Um, so I, I think I think the young coaches are way more advanced than 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 I was when I was starting out. But again, I, I was I've been really fortunate just to work for and with great people that I that I learned so much from at a young age. Coach, this isn't uh, well, I guess it's an observation. It's sort of a question. You talking about your resume and looking at it. You really haven't had to leave New Jersey. Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, that's pretty yeah, incredible. Yeah, it is. It is. It's, it's a good in a, thing in a in a in a, in a, um, in a job that usually is very vagabond. Yes. Yes, hundred percent. I mean, it's yeah, it's a it's a good thing. I mean, as I look back, I probably should have made some moves at an earlier point in my career, um, just to get different exposure and 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 to be around different things. But no, you're right. I mean, there's so many guys that you talk to that you know have done this 20, 30 years, and they've made eight, ten, twelve different moves throughout the country. And I, I've been fortunate that again, I've worked for in really good programs for really good people that haven't gotten fired. Um, so, you know, like my, my choices have been 
my choices as opposed to you're on a staff and you know you get, you get they get fired and then then now you're scrambling now you don't have the options i've been able to make moves you know again i went from a d3 graduate assistant to an assistant at the big east level and then my next move was to be a head coach so yeah it, it's and, and i've stayed at schools for a long time some i probably stayed too long i, <laughs> I probably you know should have made just decisions to be exp- again to be exposed to different things, but um, yeah, it's it's it is kind of unique in that regard. So, coach, I, I have a question. You talked about you you got cut, you couldn't play at your high school, which I guess was just looking here somewhere in the oranges. Did you go? Yeah, to- Columbia, you Columbia, Columbia High School in, in Maplewood. Yeah, which, Maplewood. Which, when I was in high school, was a really good program, and just yeah, I was just the the late blooming <laughs> kid who you know just reality wasn't good enough. So you decided to get into coaching. You said you had that, that coach that kind of helped you out. Do you have any recollection of that and the overwhelming? I really, I still remember the overwhelming sensation of crap. What do I do? <laughs> How, what, what's the first thing I do in practice? No, I do. I do. I, I have a pretty vivid memory of it. And it's funny. I, I was in Maplewood about a week ago and drove by. We, I was the freshman coach for one of the years when I was coaching in high school and we, we would kind of travel between either high school or the, to, the two junior high schools in town. And, and one of the, the, the first practice that we had was at one of these junior high schools. And I, I kind of think back to that often when I drive past it and uh, about a week ago, I was in town for, I don't even remember why, uh, but drove past it and kind of had a quick flashback to it. But yeah, it's like, you're, you're there with, you know, whatever, 12, 15 kids who were, you know, whatever they were, four years, five years younger than I was at the time, looking at you for, you know, guidance and leadership. And yeah, you, you kind of have that like, wow, this is cool. But also, wow, like, oh, my God, I, I got <laughs> I to know what the heck I'm talking about now. Don't screw it up. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Coach, uh, Kevin O'Connell was uh, an administrator at University of South Carolina. He just recently retired. He was overseeing basketball and, and a couple other sports. And I had a conversation with him a couple of years ago. And we were talking about jobs and trying to jump and move up. And he said, Brian, and he's, he's been a longtime administrator. And he said, Brian, there's two things I've learned. He said, one, so the money is not worth it. And he said, two, I have to work for somebody that has the same values that I have. And I was like, wow, and I, that has stuck with me, and I never forget it. I talk about it all the time with my coaches, and I was talking about with a coach that's not at my school um, uh, about uh, some of the things that he's running into with his administration, not really seeing uh, things the way that he sees them or believing in the same things that he believes in when, when it comes to, to his sport, um, and just kind of that that dichotomy, that bumping of heads, like, well, I, I need this job. I need income. I love what I'm doing. But at the same time, I'm bumping heads with my administration. I just, it just struck me when you talk about you've worked with some really, really good people. So can you tell us more about just the value of working with good people that believe in the same things that you believe in? You can't put a money tag on it, a price value on it. It's so important. And it's, so, it's, it's yeah, it's becoming more and more difficult, I, I think. You know, you you hear a lot of the, you know, especially this time of year with basketball, all, all the new coaches, their press conferences, and you see clips. And I think the word alignment comes up so often now, but to our synergy within the university, the athletic department, the upper administration, then your relationship with the athletic director and the coach, um, crucial, crucial. I, I think it's... It, it's as important as as any um, anything that's going to contribute to winning. I think that's that's top of the list because you know, as you guys know, this is a tough profession when everything's great. When when you're aligned with everyone, when you have great kids in your program, great staff, it's still a really difficult uh, profession to be successful in. And you can say about any sport, it's tough to win. And it's tough to get into that right position. So I, I think, you know, I think it starts with the process of, you know, within the interview process, where as a coach, you know, you need to be interviewing the people that are hiring you to, to make sure that you, you're in alignment and that you're on the same page and that what, what you see is important 
Daisy is important as well. Cause if not, you're just going to consistently butt heads. And cause it, you know, again, even in, in good, in good situations, there's always, I don't know, conflict between the two, between an administration, between a coach, you know, you, you just hope you, you have an athletic director or, or a sports supervisor that hopefully, you know, ideal world used to be a coach and you, you hope that they have that, um, that understanding of what you're going through. Um, but I, I've, I've worked in places where the ADs were former coaches and, you know, uh, it's kind of like head coaches who used to be assistants, forget what it was like. They have amnesia and forget what it was like to be an assistant coach. Sometimes administrators, who used to be coaches kind of have that same amnesia and they forget what that, what it was like when they were a coach. So yeah, it's, it's a challenge, you know, and I think, I think as an assistant, it's really important that you, yeah, you work for someone that there, there, there's a, there's just a common core belief and a value system and, and not necessarily basketball X and O philosophy. I mean, I think that helps as well, but just like what, you know, what matters to you as a coach, as a person that, that you're somewhat on the same page. And um, cause again, I think it just eliminates a lot of difficulty down the road. That's a great answer. Uh, I, I, I know coaches that have become administrators that completely forget what it was like to be a coach. Uh, one of them, I co-host a podcast. Uh, I knew he was going to go there. I knew, that, I knew that we'll edit that part out. You <laughs> Um, no, but that's, that's great. It's a great answer. And I, I, Brian, I don't know if I ever told you this conversation I had with, with an early guest of ours, a buddy of ours, Darby Rich, who's now the strength coach at Memphis with Penny Hardaway. And, uh, when I, when I was talking to him, when he got to Memphis, he said, he said, Chris, he said, five minutes into the interview, I was looking him dead in the eye and he goes, I knew I had to come here and work for him because we just connected on the same level, we had the passion about the same thing. And I said, well, that's great. Cause he had a good job at Texas A&M. And I remember asking him like, why did you make this jump? And like he said, five minutes in that interview, I just saw that we connected on that same level and, and just had the same values. And that's, that's great when it can happen like that. It is. But coach, the name of the podcast, the greatest games. Okay. Uh, you've been a part of a lot. Again, I'm not, not trying to say you're old, but uh <laughs> But you're going to take us back in time to one of the classic NCAA championship games of all time. And you're going to tell it from your perspective. Seattle, Washington, 1989, the Kingdome, I believe, at the time, right? Yes, correct. The Kingdome. Take us there. Give us the give us the lowdown. Bring us into the locker room with the Seton Hall Pirates and and that great environment and uh, you know that game and how it how it shook out. Yeah, yeah. You know what? It, it really was. A, 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 I mean, obviously the tournament's three weekends, but for us it, it was a three week journey because we started in Tucson, Arizona. <laughs> um, then we went to Denver and then Seattle and we, our spring break coincided with this trip. So we did not go home. Oh, and this was, wow. this was before, you know, the days of teams chartering the NCAA chartering you to, to, to the sites. I mean, we, we you know, so this is all like commercial flights. So we did not go home. Um, now I, I say we, the team did not, I actually did because the E after, after we knew we were in the final four, we, we won in Denver on a Saturday and that Sunday, the East regional final was actually at the Meadowlands where we played. And so I flew back and I, I did all the scouting for, for the opponents. And, and again, a little bit different how we did it back then. And so I, I literally did every scout. Um, so I flew back to New Jersey. I, um, I, I want to say it was like, boosters and cheerleaders and bands somehow they had a charter flight back to Jersey <laughs> and I somehow got on that flight drove to the Meadowlands Sunday um watched the game scouted and then I was on a flight the first flight Monday morning to actually Los Angeles because basically our AD at the time said to the kids all right we have a week 
to, you know, we have a couple of days till we have to be in Seattle. We're in Denver, Colorado. Like, where do you guys want to go? And we, we had a kid on our team from LA and he kind of talked everyone into let's go to LA. So, so the travel party flew to LA for, I don't even remember three or four days, whatever it was, you know, Sunday, probably Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And I, on Monday flew back to LA, met up with the team. You know, we had a couple practices in LA and then flew to Seattle. But, um, you know, it was just, as you look at the teams that we beat to get there and, and, you know, it was just an amazing run, you know, to beat Duke, to beat Indiana, um, you know, just iconic programs, iconic coaches. And, um, you know, no one outside of probably New York and New Jersey really knew who Seton Hall was. That, that was kind of the running joke, like Seton who was all over the newspapers. And, you know, this was prior to the internet. So it was a very isolated, uh, you know, kind of, we were in our own little cocoon for three weeks and, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, obviously one of the greatest games in, in final four history, just the drama of it over time, you know, controversial call at the end and, um, you know, in a phenomenal game, you know, Michigan with four or five NBA players on that team and just, you know, the, the, you know, the state university, the powerhouse football team, against a small little Catholic school in Northern New Jersey. So just a, a lot of contrasts and, uh, but yeah, just a terrific, terrific game. So I want to start with that trip to LA <laughs> and just, I love the behind the scenes of that. Just thinking like, okay, you, you, you're going to go back home. And then go. So what was it like three to four days in LA before moving on, just hanging out with the guys. Like you talk about it, it's kind of a cocoon and it's kind of ironic here. We've been in this cocoon right. all season with COVID and teams being together. So what, what was, what yeah, was that it, it was, like? it was, it was cool. I mean, it's still, you know, it's, it's LA, it's beautiful weather. You're coming from a, you know, a hard winter in New Jersey. And it, it, it was good because again, we were, we were just kind of isolated. It was just a travel party. We could walk down the streets and people didn't really know who we were. You know, today's world, we probably couldn't do it, but they didn't really know like who we were. So it, it, it was kind of a catch your breath moment, you know, from, from the prior two weekends, um, you know, the, the, the kid on our team, you know, again, he, he said, you know, oh, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. I got my guy with the Lakers. We'll get Laker tickets. The, the kid actually now is one of Kevin Hart's managers. So he's made like a pretty good career for himself. But, um, yeah, it was just fun. Just, you know, we, we still did our work and still practice and still did what we needed to do. But it, it was kind of in, in, the, in the midst of obviously the final four of, of catch your breath before we got to the final four, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, we still, we did our practices, we did our video work, we did our, you know, our preparation um, and, you know, spent a couple of days in nice weather and then, you know, flew up to, to Seattle and all right, let's go. It's, it's all, it's all business. Um, you know, it was kind of our approach. We just had a very, it was just a very business-like approach with our team, with our coaching staff. And, you know, we got to Seattle and again, you know, obviously it gets ratcheted up a little bit, but even there, we, we stayed out. My recollection was kind of out near the, the airport. We didn't really, we went downtown one afternoon with the kids just to let them experience a little bit of the final four atmosphere. But, you know, again, just very, you know, or whatever our travel party, 20 people, 25 people, that was kind of it. And, and it was just a very focused group and, um, you know, just, just took care of business day at a time. You know, let's have a good practice day. All right. Let's have a good video session. Let's have a good lift. Um, and whatever we did, it was just very controlled and, you know, kind of here's the task at hand. Let's take care of our business. Coach, I, I want to go back to the beginning of that season and, and that team that you had. Um, obviously, some, some great New York, New Jersey names. You had Johnny Morton on that team. And you had the international star and Andrew Gaze, obviously, guys who went on to play in the NBA. I'm just looking at that season. Again, for me, I was a young kid at the time, so it's classic programs and classic coaches. But you guys rip off 13 wins in a row to start the season. You go up to the Great Alaska Shootout, 
Brian and I had the chance to go there and a great time, a great tournament. You beat Kentucky. Was Coach Sutton still there? Or was that when they had just went on yeah. probation? Yeah, Eddie, okay. Eddie Sutton. Correct. Okay, Sutton's at Kentucky. Roy Williams, his first year at Kansas, I yep. believe. Yes, yep, exactly. You play St. John's, obviously Coach Carnesecki. You play Princeton, Coach Carrill. Virginia, was Terry Holland still the coach there? Um, I That's a good one. I think he was, My if my memory serves. <laughs> yeah, we played them down in New Orleans. In, in New Orleans, yeah. you played DePaul, yep. who had uh, Meyer. Oh, Joey coach? Meyer. Joey Meyer. And then you played Georgetown, obviously, Coach, uh, coach Thompson, the late yep. great John Thompson. You rip off 13 in a row. You know, right, and you get to New Year's, and then you lose to Syracuse, who was number two in the country at the time. But just talk about that early season and and how good you guys thought you could be, or how good Coach Carlissimo thought you guys could be. We knew we were going to be good. I mean, to sit here and say in September, October, we thought we were going to play in a national championship. Yeah, I, I'd be I'd be lying if I said that. But we knew we were going to be good. We had a very experienced group. You know, at that time, obviously, the Big East was was the conference. You know, that that was that was the league in the country. And you knew if you could get through the Big East battles every night that and that's why I think the teams in the Big East have always done so well in the tournament, because you're exposed to so many different styles of play, atmosphere, crowds, environments. You, you get to the big stage. You're, you're on a big stage every night in the Big East. So nothing was going to rattle that this group. And then, you know, I think Andrew Gaze was kind of the cherry on top for that this team where he, he just gave a different, different mentality, a, a different approach to the game. You know, we like you said, we had a lot of New Jersey, New York City, tough kids and here comes a guy, you know, comes a guy with gray hair who could probably barely dunk the ball, but was such a, you know, he was such a good player and, and he just fit in so well with that group and, and had no ego about him. Um, I mean, he's literally like Michael Jordan in Australia. He, he's that big in, in the basketball world in Australia and you would have never known it. And he just gave a dimension that, you know, passing, shooting, experience, leadership, quiet leadership, but leadership. And, you know, we were a deep team. Um, you know, we knew we were going to be good uh, to say we would sit there and win 13 in a row or, you know, get to get to the NCAA final. I, you know, I don't know if we would have said that, but in our hearts, we knew this was going to be a really good team. And Gaze had that competitive fire, too. Which, he did. Yeah. He just was, he was unique. He was a really unique player and he just, he just brought such a, he brought guys together from different backgrounds, different cultures, different. Hey, we're not going to lift. We're going to go shoot 500 shots instead of lifting. But you know what? He'd go in there and, and again, he, he probably wasn't any stronger than any of the coaches. You know, he'd sit there bench 90 pounds and he'd laugh about it and joke with the guy. So I, I think they saw he was like just very vulnerable about himself and just like a, a really um, just a willing superstar to blend in. You know, he had played in Olympics already and, yeah, right. and he had you know, Olympics, yeah. such a high level of success at a young age. That, and, and I think he just, he showed the other guys of just this about team and this about winning and being together. And, um, you know, again, I think he, he was kind of the, the last piece of that puzzle that we needed. Brian, just to go through some more of the coaches, not just, so they go through the big East 11 and five, then in the NCAA tournament, they beat uh, Bobby Knight, Jerry Tarkanian and Mike Krzyzewski. Yep. Three in a row. Just so, <laughs> I mean, the, I would like to add up the the total number of wins of coaches you guys played there, because uh, it'd yeah. be about a billion wins. Oh, you're, you're not kidding. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, it's it's you know, I, I thought back to that a couple of weeks ago when Coach Williams retired, and you know, like that, we were literally probably his. I don't know because that was a start of the season. Was, yeah, it was just probably like, second, the third game, second, third game, and 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 you could tell. She, I remember even back then, you know, seeing him play and scouting like, like, wow, this guy's going to be really good. Just the style. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. That would be a great stat. I mean, between, yeah. 
Coach Knight, Coach Thompson, Bayheim, Shashevsky, Roy Williams, Tarkani. I mean, it's got to be 4,000 wins. Jim Jim Calhoun. Calhoun, yep. Rowley uh, at Villanova. Rowley at Villanova. Stacca. Who was at Providence at the time? Um, Rick ba- uh, Was it Barnes or yeah, Pete Rick Killen? Barnes. I think Rick Pitino had just left. My first, they go to the Knicks. Yeah. yeah right. And Rick, okay, Rick Barnes. Rick he has Barnes. a lot of wins. Yep. He does, he's yep. not a chump. <laughs> no. no, I mean, it, yeah, the, the coaching, like I said, the coaches that you would go against every night was amazing. And that for me as a young guy who was doing all the scouting, when and back then you could live scout. So two or three nights a week, I'd be at games, you know, wherever within the Big East. So every night you're, you're literally seeing – a hall of fame coach and studying that coach and going back and watching a video and preparing. So, I mean, for, for me as a young guy in his early twenties at that time, I, I was able to get such a, a, an education into just such high level coaches of how, you know, again, you're not there on a daily basis, but you still, that was always one of the values of in-person scouting where you just got a different sense of, the the team and the coach and the program as opposed to nowadays, you know, you're, you're sitting there on your computer and you can call up every pick and roll with three clicks of them of your mouse, Mm -hmm. but you're, you're missing that kind of live vibe that you get from, from seeing a team. So coach, you talk about preparing and I'm looking at this Michigan roster, Glenn Rice, Ramil Robinson, Lloyd Vaught, future NBA guys averaging 25. And then there's that story of the Bill Frieder that was fired right before this, uh, before the NCAA tournament. And here comes mm-hmm. Steve Fisher ripping off five in a row. What was it like preparing for that? Was it any distractions? Cause I, and I, I was 10 years old at the time. So I can't remember if that was just the, this, the story of the country, like Steve Fisher, five in a row, Glenn Rice. Or, so what was it like preparing for a game with all that really going on and those guys that they had? Yeah. I mean, for us, it wasn't as big a deal. I remember when it came out, you know, right as the tournament was starting and we were in Arizona and, you know, it was a story for a day or two. Um, well, and Frieder was going to Arizona state. So it was, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, and Bo Schembeck or the, the football coach who was the AD said, yeah, I want a Michigan guy to coach Michigan. Yeah. And yeah, it was, it was kind of a weird dynamic. I mean, for us again, it was just, all right, that, Hey, they're, they're, they're the next team on the schedule. So once we knew we were playing them, you know, we, we obviously prepared for them, but um, yeah, it was more, you know, you, you got more concerned as you're watching them, like, wow, they're, they're really good. Like you said, I mean, they got four or five pros on that team and, you know, just a really, and obviously as you look now with Steve Fisher's coaching career, pretty good coach. He's another guy with probably six or 700 wins, um, you know, and just pros. I mean, you know, and again, I think that's, you see then you see now when you get to the final four, I mean, you better have a couple of pros on your team and they, and they had a, a multitude of them. <laughs> they did. And, uh, but you went through the, the Duke team that had uh, the Danny Ferry, obviously the, the UNLV team, which was young at the time and up and coming had Greg Anthony and Anderson hunt, I believe on the team yep, yep. as freshmen. Uh, yeah. So you're talking about pros, pros, pros. I know this is a hard one, Coach, but talking about that game, and like we said, it was legendary. It goes into overtime. There was the controversial uh, the foul call, and Ramil Robinson hits the free throws. Uh, take us into that locker room after that game and, and the words that Coach Carlissimo maybe used or or just, you know, what the mood – obviously the mood is terrible. I, we know that. But but how do, you, how do you try to sum up, you know, what you guys accomplished that year quickly in that locker yeah, room? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean – you know, and I've, t- I've talked about this often. I mean, if, for me, as you dignity and respecting the game and respecting the other team and how you handle a post game environment, you know, because again, as head coaches now, again, have I ever coached in a game like this again? No. And most coaches don't have that opportunity, but wherever you coach, you have your big games and you have your great wins and your disappointing losses and, things didn't go the way you want. How do you, you know, again, as a head coach, how do you stand in front of your kids after a game and get the message that you want to get across? And again, I mean, that'll stick with me for as long as I coach and as long as I'm done coaching of just how PJ in that moment was able to not point fingers, 
praise Michigan. You know, we had our opportunities. He never discussed. I mean, he he literally could have ruined the official's career if he wanted to with his words. And he just I remember he said, hey, he's one of the best officials in the country, which he he was. And, you know, I would want him on the game any other, you know, any time moving forward or, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, he, um, he just handled it so well. And in such a moment of, of disappointment, because the reality of it is, and we knew this was a senior dominant team that this, this was, you know, this was our moment and we got there, um, you know, just, just a lot of class and, uh, you know, just, that has stuck with me for whatever it is, 30 something years afterwards. And I know from talking to kids on this, that team still, I I think that was the the best moment of the tournament to be truthful, where, you know, you're, you're in a room with, you know, 20 people, you know, 13, 14 players and coaches and a trainer. And, you know, on the other side of the door is, you know, a hundred media people waiting to get in and talk to you. And just to kind of be together in such a time of disappointment. But I, no one really walked out hanging their heads. You know, I think everyone walked out just feeling really, you know, so it was like, you know, none of us have anything to feel bad about. I mean, we felt bad we lost, obviously, but no different than, you know, losing to Syracuse up at the Dome when they were two in the country. I mean, the moment was different. But, you know, I think as a competitor, you, you know, you don't like to lose, obviously. And, and, you know, except for one team, everyone lose ends their season in college basketball, high school basketball, whatever, disappointed. Um, but just, you know, the, the ability to kind of be together in that moment um, and kind of share that moment together was, was, was special. All right, Brian, uh, here comes the trivia question. He brought it up. Coach brought it up. Now, Coach, I'm not sure which official made the call, who you were talking about, but one of the officials on the game was John Clockerty. So the trivia question is, who gave John Clockerty his start in officiating? Brian Rosefield. Well, no, it's not Mark Batar because of the age difference there. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. But, I, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Chris de Blasio, who we have. George David Odom. Whoa, really? Coach Odom was an assistant at Wake Forest, and one of his jobs back then when you had other jobs as assistant coach, he was in charge of the intramural department, the intramural sports at Wake Forest. And, and John Cogarty was a, was a young kid, not young, probably around the same age as, as Coach Odom, and Coach Odom hired him to be in charge of the referees for the recreation department. How about that? For the intramurals at, wow. at Wake Forest University. Didn't know that. Never heard that. <laughs> That's wild. It, you know, and coach, you talk about that, that call and I'm looking at the video and it's okay. Yeah. He, he missed the call, maybe missed the call, whatever. Um, and it just feels like the game and, and this incident, it just seems like it was just a little more pure than things are right now. And, and maybe it was just a testament to coach Carlissimo and you guys and your, but to not blame and not to point the finger, but I just can't help but wonder, uh, even at the high school level, sometimes it's, well, oh, it's that official's fault. It's, uh, you know, hey, guys, he missed the call. Or, hey, you know, it's, it, 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 you mentioned Coach Odom, Chris, about it's just one possession. You know, well, games never come down to one possession. You you gave up an offensive rebound early in the year. You missed the early in the game. You missed a free throw. I just, I just love to hear that. That, 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 hey, guys, he missed the call. We lost the game. It was a great year. I love you. And just, that just it just seems so pure to me. Yeah, you're you're so right. And, and that was one of the things that, you know, we brought up exactly what you said, you know, especially again, it, it, an overtime game. There's so many plays that dictate games and one call doesn't dictate a game. We were probably an 80 percent free throw shooting team. We shot like 64 for that game. So we were just out of our, you know, from the free throw line of we just or even close to what we did throughout the season, we, we'd be okay. So now you, you're a hundred percent right. I mean, and again, that has stuck with me as a coach, you know what? Like, yeah, don't bitch about the refs. Cause you know, we could have done a, B and C better. And, you know, it just, I mean, that's, that's sports, that's basketball. Um, and, and 
Conversely, Ramil Robinson was like a 59, 60% free throw shooter. So to that kid's credit at that time with, you know, 40,000 people at the kingdom and a, a national television audience and, and the game in his hands, he stepped up and made two free throws to his, to his credit. So, I mean, at, at some point, like that's sports, you know, that's just kind of what it comes down to. And, I, and I'll tell you this, uh, uh, they, they honored us. I don't even know how long ago at, at a Seton hall game one. And it, I don't even think it was the final four team, but it was another team. And, you know, probably, I don't know. We stayed around for the game. And afterwards I, I was with PJ and one of our other assistants. We went down to the locker room to see Kevin Willard and, one of the guys refing the game was John Clockerty's son. His son, yeah. yeah, Tim Clockerty's big time, high level official. And he's walking past us in the hallway and you could, you know, probably 30 feet away and you could almost see the look in the guy's eyes. Like, Oh man, is he going to say, you know, like just <laughs> what is, what is the next 20 seconds going to entail? And PJ went right, like, and PJ was like this, you know, PJ was a very well-known guy and and Tim Clockery did not officiate when we were there. He was probably a a young kid at that time. You know, PJ literally like introduced himself to him and, you know, the guy's looking at him like, yeah, I know who you are. And he goes, oh, make sure you tell your dad. I said, hello, tell him I was asking for him. And, and, And it was totally sincere. There was, it was, there was no, you know, agenda there. It was just, that was PJ being PJ and, uh, you know, and that was whatever it was 20 years, 25 years after the fact. And, you know, I've never heard him say a word about that game in terms of anything negative. And it just, you know, again, for me as a young coach, it was just a terrific lesson. And I think for the players, you know, it was as coaches were always trying to, you know, talk about impacting guys' lives and teaching them lessons. I mean, there's, you know, 20 year old kids at the, the, the probably, you know, the biggest, disappointment in our lives so far and just uh, you know and, and again I don't think anything he did was intentional it's just who he was but I think just such a moment um you know of teaching and just you know educating kids on like here here's the real world like like life ain't perfect you know you got to find ways to deal with it I, I, then, I love that so much Chris I'm sorry to interrupt you right. I, it's just, just about preparing kids for what's next and yeah, I understand there are times to stand up and advocate for kids and everything, but the call was made, the game's over. Why spend any time feeling bad about it? Say so it's his fault. No, hey, this is this is life. Like you just said, this is life. Yep. So Chris, I'm sorry I had to jump in on. And that. of course, at a cruel twist of fate, Ramil Robinson gets traded to the Nets in his second season and plays in. Uh, the, the Brendan Byrne Arena, yes. uh, home of the Seton Hall Pirates. Yes, <laughs> Coach, we'd like to end this on a fun question. Uh, if I asked, uh, if I asked Mark Bryant, who played for you very early on, and I asked uh, Mark Datica, who played for you these last couple seasons at, at Fairleigh Dickinson, and I said, "What's the one thing Coach Hamburger says over and over again?" What would that thing be? Um. Probably defensively. Well, from a basketball standpoint, either I, anything, yeah, anything, basketball, probably keep the ball in front of you. You know, like I'm kind of a defensive oriented coach or just guarding the ball. Um, you know, just, yeah. I mean, cliche coaches stuff. I'm, I'm big, you know, the Belichick do your job. Just, just take care <laughs> of your business. You know, um, you know, I, I, I'd like to think Mark Daddick is going to, think I'm probably a better coach than Mark Bryan did because I was so young when I was coaching <laughs> Mark Bryan. So ho- hopefully, hopefully the, the current Mark has a, <laughs> has, a, has a different perspective on me than, than Mark Bryan does. But, you know, hopefully, like we were just talking, hopefully, you know, it just as you guys do as well, you just have an impact on these kids and see them become men. Like I said, I was watching today the Nets Phoenix game and Mark, Mark Bryant's an assistant with Phoenix. And I mean, literally the guy has been in the NBA since he graduated college as a player, as a coach. And, you know, it's just, it's great when you see these guys um, become successful, whatever their, their chosen field is, and they stay in touch with you and communicate with you. I mean, that, that's kind of, I think, I like to think that's why we all got in this profession just to, you know, be impactful on, on young people's lives and, hopefully you make a difference and, and teach them and encourage them and, 
and be there for him. And, you know, that's kind of, it's kind of what, you know, I think all of us kind of gets us up in the morning and, and gets us to work of knowing that you're going to have some, hopefully some positive impact on them during the day or during their career. And hopefully after their careers. Well, coach, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, every time we have a guest on this show that, that says similar things as, as, as you just did, I'm reminded of, of why I got in the business. I know Chris is the same way, uh, whatever level that we're coaching at, it doesn't matter. So at the end of the day, it's just kids and it's just a game. It's just basketball. And it's, it's just, it, what are we doing? Like you say, just to yep. impact kids. And I think that, um, that is a, a testament to you and a, a testament for uh, you having a good long career and, uh, and, and more to come, more to come. So, uh, coach, we, we can't thank you enough for, for coming on the show and, and, uh, really, really, this has been no, really, my pleasure. Really, really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, we'll go ahead and wrap this one up. And, I, and it, the good news is, Coach, that, that you lived up to the hype. The, those 90 guys that told us that you had to come on the show, you delivered. So uh, we'll, uh, we, we can't thank you enough for that. But we'll go ahead and wrap this one up. For my co-host, Chris de Blasio, I am Brian Rosefield. And thank you for listening to this episode of the – 